microphone. Oh, yes. <laughs> Don't go to with it. Thank you for a good speech. At least you didn't go to the bathroom. Yeah, it happened. So, uh, <laughs> quick, uh, quick question here. Um, how many of you know about OpenSIPs, have heard about it, and know what it is, at least? Cool. So, uh, to everyone else, OpenSIPs is a uh, SIP proxy, and uh, leaving all the cool features aside, its main job, after all, is to route calls as many as possible. So, um, uh, today I'm going to, we're going to go through um, how the architecture has evolved in order to, uh, for, uh, for us to have the need for, for this event-driven approach. Um, we're going to talk a bit about the events themselves and how they, uh, they will uh, open up new possibilities for future development and uh, scenarios in SIP. Um, some uh, concrete examples and uh, maybe if there's some time left, uh, look into some uh, OpenSIP script. So, um, uh, regarding the architecture, uh, this, is, uh, this is a mess, but I'm going to explain it step by step. So, um, this is how uh, the most of the platform is running on OpenSIP. I mean, not most, but uh, people who are still using the 1.x series um, are using this kind of uh, linear architecture and uh, where uh, the horizontal lines are basically SIP message processing um, that depending on how it's scripted on various platforms and services may either do more CPU intensive loads or more blocking type of loads with red so um, and of course, we ideally want as uh, less blocking as possible. So um, we felt the need, this was back in uh, 2014 or something, uh, to take it a step further and sort of deal with all this b blocking I.O. which was uh, eating up or uh, reducing throughput so much on these platforms where inevitably you have to run some sort of blocking queries. I don't know, database or HTTP uh, and so forth. So uh, the 2.x architecture, um, we treated this problem and uh, we introduced asynchronous operations for, uh, for the database level. You can basically uh, throw the query and uh, resume at some point in the future. What, uh, and in all this time you can uh, as you can see, you can start doing uh, more uh, useful, useful work. So the the, SIP, the message processing is entirely dominated, or mostly dominated by green now. So um, uh, this is basically what what the two the first releases in the two series that were all about, and uh, we eventually we felt that. Even this is somewhat, uh, it's not capable of solving all the, all the issues with various scenarios. For example, um, the fact that one message uh, may interact or may uh, need to exchange data with some other message totally unrelated opens the need for, for a new mechanism. So with the, this in mind, we have the push notifications scenario, which I'm going to go through in more detail uh, in, a short, uh, in a short time. Um, also, some events from various external applications that OpenSIPs might interact with, such as um, the event socket layer of FreeSwitch, or um, various VoIP scenarios, uh, I, mean, I should say SIP scenarios, which also require this um, process to process communication. So I'm going to try and keep things as generic as possible. Let's not go into too much SIP. So uh, this is one way that th this is the first um, type of scenario in this event driven architecture which requires uh, different processes to share data. So let's assume we have a SIP message that is being uh, processed and at some point 
you have to block. You have to wait for the receival of some other uh, one, totally unrelated from a transaction point of view, that will unblock you. you. You will be able to resume processing only after that one is received. Um, of course, this is the happy scenario where you actually receive the event, but uh, you might also run into something like this. So nothing, nothing arrives. So somehow a timeout must be generated so you can take the appropriate action. Um, I'm going to ba go back a bit. And um, this is the exact uh, scenario or uh, way of information exchange that push notifications require. Um, so if we map this initial uh, request to an invite, uh, we'd now have to wait for a register. I will uh, basically, I, I will detail the, this uh, uh, some more when we get into the scenarios. But uh, as I said, let's just try to, to see the big picture for now. Um, another mode of operation of this event-driven architecture <coughs> would be when we have, again, we have a message that's being processed, but the processing can be asynchronously interrupted by the, in the same manner. So uh, a message arrives that somehow uh, affects this ongoing transaction. Um, so again, uh, the first process would have to register some handler that would run whenever the, the event is triggered. Let's, uh, let's talk about some concrete examples. Again, uh, we may have, in the, so again, in the push notification scenario, uh, we may have the need to fork. So when the call is received, we may fork to all the current desktop devices of a user. That, that's good. But we may also launch in the background these push notifications that may or may not uh, add additional calls. So as soon as his mobile devices start registering, they, they, uh, all of a sudden they are uh, receiving the calls. Of course, this assumes that he, ha uh, he hasn't yet answered the desk phone, right? Because that would uh, just set up the call. Um, another scenario that is, uh, that is possible with, uh, with this approach would be call pickups. And this would be, uh, it's, it's a very elegant solution to call pickup. So uh, the call pickup would work. In the call, again, we, uh, we receive the, the invite. And asynchronously, the pickup group would uh, would or would not generate an, an invite that would uh, take over the call. So uh, in this case, we'd have an invite waiting for a separate invite. Uh, so I'm going to now go into the event uh, mechanism and uh, look into, let's look a, into a bit more detail on how they work and uh, how we structure them. So the events are uh, triggered by some sort of, let's not just call them messages that OpenSIBS receives, but rather some point in, uh, in execution, uh, such as when a user is saved in the location or uh, any sort of uh, action like this. And uh, they will basically hold enough information, so sort of like these key value attributes, so we can properly match match them and uh, block until the, the exact event that we're looking for is received. Um, moving forward to the subscription mechanism, um, the interested processes, the OpenSIPS workers, may uh, subscribe to these events and um, again they may use the attributes I mentioned earlier to filter uh, to filter them so, so, they can, uh, so they can receive the appropriate response. And uh, the response are the, these notifications, um, which will be dispatched to uh, whatever, uh, to, the, uh, mention, to the subscribers I mentioned earlier. And uh, it all works as a pub sub model. It's, uh, it's pretty straightforward. So uh, now that the theory is away, 
We can uh, go into some uh, concrete examples and uh, the long-awaited push notifications uh, discussion. So uh, for those of you who, I'm sure most of you know what this is all about, but for those uh, of you who don't, I'm going to quickly go through how these work and what limits. Okay. So how, um, what the purpose uh, is. So uh, when a call is received, if a user is not found, uh, a mobile device user, we can uh, throw this push notification to get it to register and uh, ultimately receive the call. Um, and uh, the main usefulness of this is uh, to save some uh, save battery on these mobile devices because you cannot have them constantly registering to the platform because uh, they would be drained pretty much pretty pretty fast. So SIP is quite uh, quite expensive from this point of view. So um, with this in mind, uh, the funny thing is that you once we made the async and all the we turned as many blocking operations into their uh, async counterparts as possible, we actually made it possible to implement push notifications already in the 2.2 uh, branch. But uh, this is a bit deceiving and uh, I'm going to talk a bit about how they work now. So this was one of those scenarios you don't even, uh, you don't consider, right? Because you're here in time and it's, you'd have to be a genius to just foresee everything. So you do it like this, call arrives, we, send the push notification, and then we do this sort of uh, feedback loop where we asynchronously sleep and um, just do this poll. If he's registered, sleeps, if he's not registered yet, sleep some more. So uh, yeah, this is sort of a, uh, you know, hackish way to do it, but it apparently works. So what are the problems with this approach? So. Um, First of all, it's a performance killer because uh, if we go back a bit, we can, uh, it's a trade-off between user responsiveness and uh, how, um, how much we want to spend in terms of CPU. So also, it's inflexible. It cannot handle scenarios where we'd want to <coughs> successively ring multiple mobile devices of that user. Uh, we can only do it once. Also, the same idea applies to uh, failover to multiple gateways. It, we only are able to do it once. So all of these issues are solved in the with the event-driven paradigm, uh, because now once the call arrives, we simply subscribe for this event, uh, register event. Of course, we parameterize it a bit with Bob AOR, and we install this handler. Um, but also, we can, uh, of course, we launch the push notification and we fork the phone call uh, the, to the devices that are currently registered. And should, uh, should the push notification actually work, we simply uh, add some more branches, add the appropriate branches and do it as many times as needed. Um, another possible application would be to, would be that it opens the door to automatically detect uh, robots on the other side, so I mean um, fax machines or uh, or voicemail. So in this, with this in mind, we would subscribe to uh, a DTMF event uh, linked to a certain call ID and uh, simply forward the call. If, uh, if the media server, so when the media server starts sending the events, we will take the appropriate actions. We will uh, invoke the handler and uh, hang up if, if it timed out or if he, I don't know, pressed the wrong digit, I guess. Um, so uh, also jumping into some OpenSIP script, uh, things would kind of look like this. Um, uh, we subscribe to the AOR, we we send, uh, I guess it's on the on this slide. <laughs> this is how uh, the push notification code would look like. Um, and so let's go through it a bit. We append some headers and uh, make a post using the REST client module. Um, and then I went back. And now we will fork to his existing branches 
and uh, halt the execution. Uh, I think, yeah, I've also added the handler. Once uh, the events start arriving, so the, the registrations, uh, we can do the appropriate checks uh, based on, because this is again uh, another can of worms, the, the whole uh, uh, detecting of unique contacts and so on and so forth, but uh, we basically relay only when it's needed. Um, so to draw some conclusions, uh, this, uh, this new paradigm is, um, is very powerful. It's, uh, it's going to make script usage a lot easier because um, if we go back to the, a bit to the async method, that really kind of produces a lot of ugly code. So uh, th that's going to be uh, another boost. And uh, it opens the doors to all these complex scenarios that you solve within just a couple of lines of code. And uh, it's also going to, it's quite extendable. So we can define as many events as we want. Um, a couple of words about uh, the whole release that's uh, due to some sort of mid-March. Um, this is just the tip of the iceberg, the event-driven approach, um, because the release is codenamed integration. And uh, it incorporates a lot of, um, uh, I mean, integrations with various projects that are vital to any critical VoIP uh, app application or uh, system, such as uh, capturing SIP packets, handling billing, uh, media server, with the, and uh, maybe adding some, uh, some middleware, RabbitMQ. So as a takeaway message, uh, keep in mind that there is still room for some tweaking, so please give us a shout out on the mailing lists or uh, IRC, uh, and uh, if you feel like you could improve on the design, uh, by the way, all of these will be uh, will be available shortly online, so uh, we can maintain this feedback loop on the event-driven approach. So thank you. And, uh, if you have any questions, <laughs> sure. Uh, what kind of support is needed at the endpoints? I mean, you're speaking about sending a, some, some push requests to the device the at the endpoint uh, register, so it can receive the invite. So yes. That means your, your endpoints need to be intelligent enough to handle this thing and a plain old uh, desk SIP phone or maybe just a regular mobile phone don't know how to deal with this. Do you uh, need a dedicated SIP client on your phone, for example, to take advantage of this infrastructure? Uh, definitely, because it, uh, we're talking about mobile and uh, desk phones may register as often as they want. In fact, uh, the problem is that mobile devices need to register often, right? So they have these short registration times and this is why the push notifications and uh, as you said... Um, so you're talking about the dedicated SIP client? Yeah, yeah. yes, uh, of course. It's, it's, uh, it's all about the app. It has to handle these. It needs to wake up, right? It, uh, the push notification results in a wake up of the VoIP app. So it, it registers and receives the call. Couple more minutes. Sure. How many of these uh, dedicated VoIP apps exist already that know how to deal with push notifications? Uh, I wouldn't, I would only say that Zoiper. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so I basically, yeah, I, I, I guess the question, we should uh, turn it backwards. Is, are there any apps that do not wake up and register, right, when they receive a push notification? Because, uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's... Uh, there any apps yeah. that don't register? <laughs> yeah, I, I don't think so. The thing is, because iOS and Android will cut your connections, especially iOS, like there is no hmm? connection around it. There used to be one, but not anymore. So now, if you want your VoIP app to basically be, be responsive when it's in the background, and when you're in the background, it will cut your TCP connections, so you're dead. You cannot do anything. Uh, you do have like three minutes of runtime, I think, that when you go to background to set up stuff. So you're like, okay, let me know when I have a call. And then you need to set up, it's not like enabling push notifications. You need to have, like your backend needs to have to keep track of the device IDs, and when you get the call, send it to the right device. 
So it's not like.